Hello and welcome to Varn Blog Solo. And today we begin with a question that isn't obvious. Why is it in a time where there's perpetual crises, the crisis of the racial reckoning, the crisis of Me Too, the crisis in Ukraine, the economic crises, which are perpetually fed, even when uh, on one level the numbers look better or, than before? Why is it that it seems that a country that is in North America that is actually food secure um, when in, when you integrate it with all of North America, not just United States, uh, and energy secure seems to constantly be having crises that it can't fix. Why can't we fix the infrastructure? Um, why are there literally trains exploding and unidentified flying objects being attributed to spy satellites and being shut down all over the place? Um, what is going on? See, what we've seen is a movement from, frankly, crises that often induce moral panic. For example, the kids in cages, which the kids in cages has been an administrative reality. Yes, it was different under the Obama administration that than Trump administration. But the first thing I saw liberals do um, is try to justify how there was a there was a fun a substantive difference between the Obama and Trump policies. Well, the Trump policies were more vindictive. There wasn't a substantive difference, and there's not a substantive difference now. In fact, many of the policies that were that Trump was condemned for, aggression towards China, this, uh, um, the the deliberalization of immigration, um, which really goes all the way back to the failures of the Bush administration to pass a a second immigration liberalization act, which by the way, was passed under conservative auspices in the past. Um, why have these not happened? Like, why did you, why have we not seen a reversal or even really public outcry once Biden took over? Now there's the obvious cynical answer and the cynical answer is partly true. All right. It's not in the Democrats interest and it's not in the left's interest because they see themselves as aligned with the Democrats against Republicans. But the fact that negative partisanship works the way it does now and has since the 1990s uh, and was controllable in the 1990s in a way that it's not now. Like, in many ways, the party insiders in, in the 90s reconsolidated power over this long process that began with the primaries in the, in the late 1960s, which led to high levels of political instability. And then, but both on the left and the right, and here I mean by the Republicans and the Democrats, you see a consolidation of a new center and a realignment that people didn't even notice through the primary process. The primary process was one of the ways labor actually fell out of the negotiations over politicians. I know that strikes everyone as weird because everyone believes in mass politics now, even though they don't have a means to procure it. And they don't want to look at why they can't procure it. But the crisis actually does emerge out of something. Just like neoliberalism has its roots in Fordism. So the economic justifications of how we handle recession cycles and the fact that, yes, Virginia, without pre-endossable lessons, you really wouldn't have a profitable economy. We also have to deal with the fact there's a change in the political logic from petrol crisis from the neutral administrative state, but that they are rooted in one another. And I'm going to go to philosopher, uh, political philosopher and political scientist Michael Sandel. This is from his 1996 book, uh, Democracy's Discontent. And I will say this is not a Marxist or materialist explanation of what's, of what's happening. But actually, even Marxist and materialists such as Mike McNair have pulled from similar theories. Mike McNair uses a lot of Quentin Skinner, who is a British historian who writes about, uh, you know, Republican traditions and, and, and what liberty meant before the ascent of liberalism. And what that actually did for the political discourse and how, you know, socialists had to take advantage of that in their Republican advocacy. Um, historically, 
because in the bourgeois in the marxist conception of the bourgeoisie the bourgeoisie had a mission and the the problems of its economic situation and for example in france would lead it to falling back against its mission so liberalization i.e the, the removal of old communal bonds for the rationalization of the economy was part of the bourgeoisie's epic and it's celebrated in the communist manifesto um but there's a, a dark side to it and after the revolutions and counter-revolutions in the 1850s 1860s what marx starts to talk about is bonapartism and the fact that liberalism starts to re- to not deliver on its promise now this is actually completely consistent with like current temperament research right liberals become more conservative under stress there's study after study that indicates this now i i admit that i am somewhat skeptical that this is explains people's substantive politics because uh if if personality led to consistent politics like this then politics would never have massive shifts change and realignments and it does so this cannot be an explanation we have to look at these naturalizations as avoiding some of the picture but it doesn't mean with the descriptions of people's temperament aren't true but likewise when we come to michael sandell a communitarian who is hard to categorize sandell is the student of charge taylor and the uh the thesis advisor of yasha monk so he's a thesis advisor of somebody who's important to the contemporary SPD in germany he was advised by the kind of pro-liberal pluralist communitarian Charles Taylor. Uh, but Sandel is kind of considered a man of the left. His t- tyranny of merit in his books about how markets can't build moral functioning uh, were often seen. And I've seen the Guardian say that Sandel is, is a left wing professor. But Sandel is also sometimes described as part of the communitarian right, not because he supports capitalism or doesn't support the welfare state or any of that but because he thinks that Republican values require consistent national communities and they don't have to be. In fact, he's quite clear that they probably shouldn't be associated with nations as organic communities, like nations of races or or, or types, uh, but they do have to have a, a consistent values project. Now, the Marxist in me goes, well, that, that doesn't explain everything. Why do people have the values that they have? Not just that they have the values that they have. But I will say that we should be careful of criticizing a book because it doesn't do what we want it to do. Like we often ask it to do a what or a why or how does it fix the problem when it's just describing the problem. It might be describing it in terms that we wouldn't describe it ourselves, but it doesn't make the problem less real. So how do we get to this point of perpetual crisis seemingly the only way we have political legitimacy? Why does this mean that the that the oligarchs within the parties, both parties, seem to be able to use that to stay in power, and yet also are constantly dealing with insurgencies in their own base that they would rather go away. And in the case of, say, Stromer's Labor or in the Democrats, they make go away through other crises. So the crises are never solved or fixed. There's no incentive to fix them. But how did we get there? Remember how I said there is a continuity of logic between, say, the kind of uh, pre-New Deal, the Fordist, Keynesian, post-New Deal economics of the liberal consensus in the 1950s, 1960s, and which fell apart in the 1970s, because it did focus on public-private partnerships, the creation of new markets. It just did so with a strongly mitigated welfare state. Now that welfare state has been privatized and consulted and and farmed out and labor has no seat at the table, or in the case of Europe, has some seat at the table, but it's less significant and more seen as a control appendage of the state in many cases, even when the welfare state is more generous which has also led to backlashes, which is why people can't explain why if if uh, Sweden and Norway and um, our democratic socialist utopia is why is there always a right-wing nationalist movement emerging in them, which there is, by the way, 
you know, yes, it's a much more humane nationalist movement than say Hungary or or whatever, but the, the people can't deny that it's happened in Denmark and Sweden uh, and to some degree Norway. But how did this happen? Now, I'm going to focus on America here because I know it better and because it's the hegemonic power and I happen to be from it, but also because there's a way in which a lot of what's going on right now, the perpetual crisis is the, the marginal politics becoming more and more common. So radicalization becoming more and more common and yet unable to do anything, confusing symbolic gestures towards it with actual substantive shifts in policy are a power. My friends, you're not any closer to Medicare for all than you were 10 years ago, even with a forced vote tactic. So ask yourself, what would we do about that? How would we, we can't even have a reformism that matters. You are not even achieving the kind of uh, power that you had over Hillary Rodham Clinton advocating for something like single payroll health care in 1993. You are further away from that, despite the socialist revival, than you were in 1993. Why don't you think about that? Why does that ever come up? Why, why do we pretend that the history of even contemporary politics that is often talking in terms that go all the way back to the 1960s and 70s started, I don't know, in, tw in 2008? Like, we don't really deal with the neoconservative period and all that. Why? The world didn't stop with Occupy Wall Street, my friends. Or even with Seattle 98. But let's ask ourselves that by going back to a book from 1996 that talks about the posture of this state, both the legal administrative posture of this state and the public philosophy that accompanied that posture. Like, this is from the first chapter of Democracy's Discontents, The Public Philosophy of Contemporary Liberalism by Michael Sandel. And I remember returning to a lot of these communitarian thinkers because while they're not leftist, and they might not totally help us. They will help us get our values straight. Because our values matter. It is not just who we are doing something for, but what we are attempting to do. If you have a subject, but the subject has no agency and no principles, you have nothing to cohere that subject. And I don't mean this in just like the automaticity of, of the theology of history making the working class a universal class. I don't even think that Marx totally thought that. But even if he did, all right, then, was, then we have issues there because you have to explain why those predictions never happened and why it's always alliances with other classes that cause it. And it, it used to be admittedly that even the anti-revisionist Marxists admitted they had to revise Marx to make this work. And now... Ironically, at the time where Marx is the least uh, relevant to any power, even in places that are nominally communist, um, you don't see these discussions in these terms anymore. Why is that? What's going on there? And why can't you ask these questions? It is not, as someone says, as I've actually said, anyone who tells you no one is talking about this is usually lying to you. It's someone always talking about it. The question is, why are you talking about it in certain ways and not others? So let's get to there. From Michael Sandan's book from, I believe, 1996. This is the 1998 edition, Democracy's Discontent. Times of trouble prompt us to recall the ideas by which we live. But in America today, that is not an easy thing to do. At the time when dem democratic ideas seem ascendant abroad, and this, again, was true in 1996, doesn't feel as true now. Although I will point out that there's, like, before World War II, most countries were not democratic. After World War II, it does seem that the bourgeois revolution and the, and, uh, the persistence of the ancien regimes that Corot Arnold Meyer fell apart. Another day, and we can talk about those books later. There is reason to wonder why I've lost possession of them at home. Our public life is rife with discontent. Americans do not believe they have much say in how they are governed and do not trust the government to do the right thing. Still true. Still true regardless of left and right, by the way. 
Despite the achievements of American life in the last half century, the victory in World War II, unprecedented affluence, the greater social justice for women and minorities, the end of the Cold War, our politics are, bas- are beset by anxiety and frustration, and often even denial that those benefits even happened. And to be fair, if you're younger than 45, you barely remember them. The political parties, meanwhile, are unable to make sense of our condition. The main topics of national debate, the proper scope of the welfare state, the extent of rights and entitlements, the proper degree of government regulation, take the shape from an argument of the early, of an earlier day, basically the 1950s and Fordism. That's me interjecting there. These are not unimportant topics, nor did they nor do they uh, reach the two concerns that lie at the heart of democracy's discontent. One is the fear that, individually and collectively, we are losing control of the forces that govern our lives. And by the way, after after 2001, we pretty much did lose control of governor our lives. We have 20 years of this now. Going back to the book. The other is the sense that, from family to neighborhood to nation, the moral fabric of community is unraveling around us. No, we just deny that there was ever a moral fabric in the first place. These two fears, the loss of the self-government and the erosion of community, together define the anxiety of the age. It is anxiety that the prevailing political agenda has failed to answer or even address. Why is American politics so ill-equipped to allay the discontent that now engulfs it? The answer lies beyond the political argument of our day and the public philosophy that animates it. By public philosophy, I mean the political theory that is implicit in our practice, the assumption about citizenship and freedom that inform our public life, the inability of contemporary mental politics to convincingly, uh, to speak convincingly about self-government and community has something to do with the public philosophy by which we live. Public philosophy is an elusive thing, for it's constantly before our eyes. It forms often unreflective background to our political discourse and pursuits, and nor at times the public philosophy can easily escape the notice by those who live it, but in anxious times compel a certain clarity. They force us to first principles to surface and often occasion for critical reflection. Now, I want you to notice this. This is written in the 1990s, Sandel's onto something. But I also want you to think about how this feels different now. We've been under crisis management since the war on terror. The continuity and the talk about terrorists and all that is consistent from both political parties for the entire time. The focus on reconciling history, which can't be reconciled, while also not fixing the primary problems of which one is speaking. The um, black wealth has not increased hardly at all during this during the aftermath of any of the BLM protests from Ferguson to the Floyd uprisings. Why is that? Why have police issues been unaddressed despite all the talk of police abolition? And why have there been no realistic coming together about this other than ideological, frankly, trends led by activists who, by the nature of what they do, come from a background that enables them to have lots of leisure time. If you don't ask yourself these questions, you cannot see why there's something pernicious going on. And there is something pernicious going on. Let's go back to this, though, because I find Sandel in describing the conditions of the 1990s useful for where we are now. The political philosophy, we could call this in Marxist term, the functional ideology or the explicit ideology versus the implicit one, right? An ideology as the explicit ordering, um, modus operandi, the re- the explicit principles versus the implicit principles. But we can come back to that later. The, po- the political class by which we live now is a certain version of liberal political theory. Its central idea is that government should be neutral towards moral and religious views in resp- and it, its citizens' spouse. Doesn't Sundell's not dealing with why this developed, and we could talk about why this developed because I think it's material. But I think that the the functioning of sectarian differences and of community differences actually impeded capitalist growth. But nonetheless, Sandel doesn't have to explain that when just talking about this at this level. We should ask ourselves these questions ourselves. Since people disagree about the best way to live, government should not affirm in law any particular version of the good life. And instead, it should survive a framework of rights that respects persons as free and independent selves capable of choosing their own values and ends. 
stuff we don't anymore. But we talk out of our mouths about this now, and I'm going to get back to why I think that is true. Since liberalism asserts the priority of fair procedures over particular ends, except when it doesn't, um, the public life that it informs might be called the procedural republic. In describing the prevailing political philosophy as a version of liberal political theory, it is important to distinguish two different meanings of liberalism. It is in common parlance of American politics, liberalism is the opposite of conservatism. It is an outlook of those who favor a more generous welfare state and a greater measure of social and economic equality. In the history of political theory, however, which is finally caught on in America, by the way, this used to be a big revelation, now everybody kind of knows it. Liberalism has a different, broader meaning, although the conflation between two, even in, in socialists, should worry us because they go back and forth themselves between meaning A of liberalism and meaning B of liberalism. Are we con are we critiquing the shit libs? Are we critiquing liberal capitalism after the Enlightenment? Those are different things. They emerge from a similar thing, but they are different things. We have to be very clear on that. In the history of political theory, however, liberalism has a different broader meaning. In a historical sense, liberalism describes a tradition of thought that emphasizes toleration and respect for the individual rights, and that runs from John Locke, Immanuel Kant, and John Stuart Mill to John Rawls. The public philosophy of contemporary politics is a version of this liberal tradition of thought, and most of our debates proceed within its terms, although we can talk about part of the crisis of American politics in the last 10, 15 years, is the worldwide crisis of this liberalism of the administrative state attached to it because the complexity of the state in light of other complex issues such as say climate change war or the inability of any state to control logistics of international capitalism seem beyond the purview of nation state management and at the time when at first we decided to celebrate this and the close globalization theory and then retreat from it right um in focusing on national, both methodologically and politically, the answers to international problems. And I think this is true in a lot of the left now. A lot of the left is methodologically nationalist in ways that don't work. Like it is concerned with building, you know, administrative bureaucracies to, to deal with, uh, I don't know, pumping money into the, to the coffers to keep to keep social programs going by the printing of money and by administrating things like like a, a universal employment promise or something like this, making the government the employer of last resort. That is a bureaucratic vision of the answer. And then people who will tell you that they believe in this, but they're also anarchists or whatever, they, they are using immediate logic that actually undercuts a long-term logic. Well, let's get back to this, because I think this emerges from part of this problem. That a lot of people, even the people critiquing liberalism, are still liberal, but the only answer to the problems that are emerging from politics itself is crisis. And the reason why is actually related to the supposed neutrality of the state. Both in terms of its class values, but also in terms of its principles of operation and the life it promotes. The, back to Sandel. The idea that freedom consists in our capacity to choose our ends finds prominent expression in our politics and law. It is prominence is not limited to those known as liberals rather than conservatives in American politics. It can be found across the political spectrum. Republicans, big R here, uh, sometimes argue, for example, that taxing the rich to pay for the welfare programs is a form of coerced charity that violates people's freedom to choose what to do. So, interestingly, Republicans after Trump have largely stopped this argument. Democrats sometimes argue that government should assure all citizens have a decent level of income, housing, and health on the grounds that those who are crushed by the economic necessity are not truly free to exercise choice in their own domain. So this is seen as a way to ensure choice in the capital market by having a stopgap. Hence, stuff like universal basic income as an answer to it. Although the two sides disagree on how the government should act, in a way to respect individual choice, both assume freedom consists in the capacity of persons to choose their values and ends. So familiar is this vision of freedom that has become a permanent feature of American political constitutional tradition. But Americans have not always understood freedom in this way. As reigning public philosophy, the version of liberalism that offers our present debates in the recent arrival, 
a development of the last 40 or 50 years. It's a development out of the Keen, out of the Keynesian Ford estate, my friends. Its distinctive character can best be seen by contrast with rival public philosophies that are gradually displaced. That rival public philosophy is a version of Republican small r political theory. Central to Republican political theory is that the idea of liberty depends on sharing in self-government. This idea is not itself inconsistent with liberal freedom. Participating in politics can be among the ways in which people choose to pursue their ends. And according to the Republican political theory, however, sharing and self-rule involves something more. It means deliberating with fellow citizens about a common good and helping to shape the identity and destiny of a political community. The deliberate, to, deliberate, to deliberate well about the common good requires more than the capacity to choose one's ends and to respect others wise to do the same. It requires knowledge of public affairs and also a sense of belonging a concern for the whole, a moral bond with the community whose fate is at stake. To share self-rule, therefore, requires that citizens possess, or come to acquire, a certain quality of character or civic virtues. This is why the early Republicans in America were obsessed with civic virtues. Yes, some of it was to hide their own vices and slavery and whatever. This is true. But it wasn't the only reason they did it. This is why you had the construction in like the 1880s, particularly after the Civil War, by Goto Lincoln, by the way, uh, of things like civic religion, civic ceremonies. It's when we started trying to build between like 1860 and 1940, like a consistent story around Thanksgiving. The Puritan one is actually one of many. It comes rather late. But anyway, back to this. This means that the Republican politics cannot be neutral towards values and its end citizens spouse. This Republican conception of freedom, unlike the liberal conception, requires a formative politics, a politics that cultivates its sentence and the qualities of character the self-government requires. Both the liberal and Republican conceptions of freedom have been present throughout our political experience, but in the shifting measure and relative importance. Broadly speaking, Republicanism against Malar predominated earlier in American history, liberalism later. In recent decades, the civic or formative politics that has largely given way to liberalism has conceived persons as free and independent selves, unencumbered by the moral or civic ties they have not chosen. This shift sheds light on our present political predicament. For despite its appeal, the liberal version of, uh, vision of freedom lacks the civic resources to sustain self-government. This defect ill-equips it to address the sense of disempowerment that affects our public life. The public philosophy by which we live cannot secure the liberty it promises because it cannot inspire the sense of community and civic abatement that liberty requires. We can't even inspire defensive notions of autonomy and freedom. We can't because we're inconsistent on it. Even left liberals with their concerns about individual gender rights, sexuality, etc. are often doing so at the at the expense of independent of flourishing but then having to deal with the fact that other people's seeming self-conceptions won't allow for it what do you do with that right Karl Popper calls this the you know the paradox of tolerance and I'm not a popperite but there's a point to that How liberal conception of citizen freedom gradually crowded out the Republican conception involves two intersecting tales. One traces the ad advent of, of the procedural republic from the first stirrings of American constitutionalism to recent debates about religious liberty, free speech, and, private ri and privacy rights, which we've all given up anyway. Uh, privacy rights, I mean. And probably speech, too. Another trace is the decline of civic strand of American political discourse from Thomas Jefferson's day to the present. These stories have taken bring clarity to the self-image that animates and sometimes debilitates our public life. They do not reveal a golden age when all was right with American democracy. The Republican tradition coexisted with slavery, the exclusion of women from the public realm, and with property qualifications for voting, with nativist hostility to immigrants, and indeed, it sometimes provided the terms within which these practices were defended. Sandel's not an idiot. He knows that, that that part of the liberal critique, which is part of our current civic crisis, is true. Well, why is there a civic crisis in the first place? So that is a, an interesting question. It's because our civic crisis is not about material resources. We have a lot of them. And yes, it's going to get more and more complicated to use them as both the power required to run the system gets more and more exponential and the 
complications of climate and environment environmental declaration come back on you, whether or not you agree with any particular vision of this, it is true that it is happening. So why? And why did this republicanism that we're talking about in the procedural state and the administrative state become so important? Some that now the left itself defends. I listened to a left-wing law podcast, uh, five four, you know, and it's always talking about public sovereignty, but also how public sovereignty is manifest in the administrative state. But the administrative state is the least democratically responsive part of the state. It is a oligarchical and bureaucratic part of the state. Why would leftists who believe in public sovereignty also be all about empowering the administrative state? Because they realize that disempowering the administrative state helps a certain faction of their enemies. But they're not talking honestly. And I don't think it's because they're lying. I think it's because their self-conception is currently incoherent. All right? Well, public sovereignty should be the guide to the law. But that actually grants a lot of conservative arguments. Well, that the law was just an instrument of political use by other means. And now people say, yeah, but but the, the problem is public sovereignty actually didn't support the expansion of civil rights at the time in which they were expanded. They support them after the fact. And this gets liberals into a conundrum. If you constantly bring out these administrative rights through the through the, through the undemocratic parts of the state, the administrative state and the judiciary, but then their natural conservative elements of the non-democratic parts of these states is how you're maintaining them. While you're also arguing to push more and more democracy, you are in a weird bind, aren't you? The neutrality of the state and the non-political responsiveness of part of the state is seen as the manifestation of a political will of the public. But that doesn't make sense. That's backwards. It is like pretending, for example, that the Federal Reserve Bank is not part of the government. Anyway, back into this. Why do people do that? It is because we still hold on to a lot of these liberal notions, even from people who critique it from the left. Why do they do that? Because they don't have a vision of polity that's positive. All they have one is negative. And so crisis becomes the substitute for a positive political identity. Negative partisanship replaces community balance as is. No one who is honest about this will tell you that these communities were good and perfect and always functional. They weren't. But they did have powers of positive vision that we don't have now. And centrists who point this out aren't wrong. What they miss is that their own policies are why this is happening. And that is what we need to start focusing in on. But back to this book. And yet, for all its episodes of darkness, the Republican tradition, with its emphasis on community and self-government, may offer a corrective to our impoverished civic life, recalling that Republicans' conception of freedom as self-rule may prompt us to pose the question that we have forgotten to ask. What economic arrangements are hospitable to self-government? How might our political discourse engage rather than avoid the moral and religious convictions that bring people in the Republic realm, although we have now largely secularized in ways that have removed these uh, religious convictions, and our moral convictions are not justified on moral terms. They're often justified on crisis or civic or neutrality of the state terms, on the terms that anyone should be allowed to have their own life without without actually justifying the call for autonomy. I believe in personal and bodily autonomy, for example, and we should be arguing for a lot of rights on sexuality on those grounds. But how do we do that? Because a lot of people who advocate it in one area don't believe it in other areas of life. And if you don't believe me, try to make all the way we talk about sexuality on the, the modern left liberal culture makes sense. It doesn't. On one hand, we talk about sexual freedom all the time, and on the other hand, there's a weirdly puritanical streak to even expressions of sexuality right now. Why is that? From the same political philosophy. It's because it's political philosophy in crisis. It is about the protection of people but cannot justify itself in a positive vision. And why it can't may be more interesting. I think it has to do with problems of capitalism and the administration of capitalism and the overcomplexity of that. That we have too many different kinds of people to incorporate in a capitalist vision, and if we don't, you can't grow profits. 
Let's go back up. In fact, even people from the modern monetary theorist political community have told me, well, if the left would just pick a virtue and start advocating for it. And I'm like, but why don't they? The vision that everyone has is everybody else is a bad faith actor. My friend, if everyone else is a bad faith actor, the problem is you. Just like if all your partners think that hate you for a similar reason, the problem is you. You are not consignalizing yourself to reality in a way that could build such a positive vision and outline and argue for those civic virtues that you want politically. You can't do it. Why can't you? Why is everything a hodgepodge now of things defended and held only together by the crisis itself? And that is not just a left-wing problem, my friends. That is across the board in the Western world. And increasingly elsewhere, too. Why, for example, is Russian propaganda really focusing on LBT issues and the end of the Russian way of life? It's not because it's a real threat to Russia. There are much more material threats. right? And it's not because NATO has a superior way of life in which it is, you know, it is a way to frame a failure of political vision in a defensive term in terms of a crisis because you can't deliver anything positively. But that is seemingly universal with the exception of maybe China. And we'll see if that stays. The aspiration to neutrality. The idea that government should be neutral in the question of the good life is distinctive to modern political thought. Ancient political theory held that the purpose of politics was to cultivate virtue or moral excellence of citizenship. All associations achieve some good, Aristotle wrote, and the polis, or political association, aims at the highest, most comprehensive good. Any polis, which is truly so-called, is not merely one in name, but must devote itself to encouraging goodness. Goodness, teleos, the function of human life, was to live a good life. It is, they're all tied together. Otherwise, political associations seek to mean allegiances, which differ from, only differs in space from one another of allegiance, where members live at a distance from one another. Otherwise, too, soon be, uh, law becomes mere covenant, are in the phrase of the Sophist Lafidion, a guarantee of rights against one another, instead of being, as it should be, a rule of life, such as will make members of the polis good and just. Now, we will often reject Aristotle's vision of what the good and just was. I mean, this was a man who believed in natural slavery, but this is still basically the orientation of politics in the Western world, and not just the Western world. Confucian and Indian notions of politics to have similar mandates. Politics is the legitimate use of force, but legitimate use of force is done under conceits of the good life and virtue. Now, Marxists may call this ideology, and quite widely, although I've talked about the origins of ideology before, Marxists didn't invent it, actually capitalists did. Um, but what we are dealing with is a system of justifications of a rule of life. Why don't we have one right now? What is the one that we really have? Well, Marxists will tell you that it's the capitalist profit motive, but then we're not consistent in looking at the world that way, including in understanding our own institutions. Because why would our institutions be separate from that if they exist within that system? My conjecture from Sandel is that the neutral state, which removes all, all justifications of the state on what a life should look like, also has to maintain its credibility through crisis at this point, because it can't manage everything. You don't believe me? Look outside. Basic things don't function. Now, it's also true in some ways they never function, but they definitely used to function better. And this is even in corporate products that are relatively new. Think about Facebook or Google. When they were willing to blow through both government contract and tons of venture capital leveraged on debt and didn't need to recoup value from advertising, uh, they were very functional. Now that they have to recoup value through advertising, they try to control what you get from them. And thus they become more and more inundated with ads and less and less functional. And they also just don't work as they cut staff. Now I'm gonna do other videos on this whole 
logic of tech and why uh, some of the answers like social contagion is why they're laying off. Social contagion is a description of what they're doing, but it isn't why they're doing anything. The idea that most of the public institutions are just irrational, not responding to incentives is, is a way for specialists to not have to explain what the incentives are. It's a way to avoid the question. So social contagion is a description. Things spread socially and they contaminate. But why do they contaminate? So just renaming something does not tell you how it is actually functioning. Anyway. Check out this book. I don't agree with all of it. I think it has a, a very idealist classical Republican view. But we do need to deal with the classical Republican view because it was fairly coherent. And to say it was just a philosophy of the bourgeoisie actually is a problem because it's older than that. We have to deal with that. We have to come up with a conception of what the community is. It deals with all the issues of the community. Symbolic representation of things like of, of things being more equal on a moral grounds but not equally equated in any physical policy and those more grounds leading to crisis while you don't actually fix the problems inequality has not been reversed at any time in fact the irony is during the period we've talked about inequality it's only accelerated we haven't done anything about it uh unionization has not has become more and more popular all the old narratives about unionization that it's corrupt or whatever they're largely no longer believed about unions in general although people do believe them about the unions that they deal with which is kind of funny but uh, they still are dying. Why is that? The idea that it's just an ideological trick that you've just been fooled. It's actually self-flattering because you see through it. It's like the conspiracy theory. You see through the problem. You know the truth. No, you don't. You should fundamentally, as a heuristic, distrust anything that makes it seem like you specially know something. by just figuring out one or two small things and that you can do that by not by just thinking and by thinking frankly dependent on others so i'm going to come back to this book a lot i'm going to also come to another one of Sand uh sandel's book the tyranny of merit because i like it but it's got problems and we're going to talk about this we're going to talk about this vision of community this said that posits and you know the communitarians in general, even people who don't call themselves communitarians like Alessa McIntyre posit and where they're right, but also why that doesn't seem to be enough. What they're missing, the material impetus for how one inculcates any view, is because you organize your social relations and productions around it. If uh, a view of society can't be organized in that way, it won't maintain. Well, why did the administrative state? become so popular that is the actual key question start thinking about that because that's going to lead you to why the crisis state we're in right now is the dominant mode part of it is that there are real crises but there are crises that aren't coming from outside impetus most of the crises in a lot of the big states lives right now are internal not external why what is going on? Now, I've hinted that Joseph Tainter's rise and fall of complex societies gives us a hint in complexity and our inability to come up with any coherent system five on the cybernetic terms. And we can just use the earth terminology. Any metaphysical value which organizes our lives is a problem. And people might go, oh, Varn, you've turned away from the proletariat. But the proletariat was assumed to be the universal subject because it was assumed to be able to do certain things. The goal of, of society, which for Marx was freedom. Now, there are people who doubt freedom, and there are reasons to doubt it. It's a blurry word. It's a word that everyone who invokes it has different meanings for it. And dealing with those different meanings is hidden by pretending that it's neutral. As Isaiah Berlin once said, Freedom for wolves is death to sheep. Maybe that doesn't mean we should give up on freedom, but it does mean we need to understand what we're talking about. There's an Aurelian character to a lot of what we do today. The uh, Inflation Adjustment Act has nothing to do with inflation. 
the the myriad liberty acts that come out of the Republican Party actually restrict liberty. Why is that? Are you that stupid? Most people actually aren't. In fact, one of my great pushbacks is uh, while I'm very cynical about systems, I am not cynical about people. But I think all the incentives are bad. Why do we have bad incentives? Why is there a train? We have to think about these things as related systems. Why is the culture doing what it's doing? You can't change one element of it, people. It's all interrelated. It's separateness that one is downstream for the other. It's kind of an illusion. Even in economics, culture affects relations of production. And it matters. That's why there are cultural characters to the administration of capitalism. The very even within a nation. Don't believe me? Petit bourgeois stuff looks very different in the American West and the American South, even today. And then why are we using things that are totally amaterial? Why, for example, when we talk about people of color, we always focus on one part of the American tradition, which is anti-blackness and indigenous behaviors, even in BIPOC, right? But that doesn't deal with the fact that both those groups, and we should care about that for, for reasons of, of functioning, because having large populations that have been systemically excluded and depressed and kept out of wealth is not great. Um, I believe in freedom, so I have to believe in the removal of, of, of arbitrary racial bounds. But I also have to be honest and find it very weird that people tell me, well, the majority Democrat is black. And I'm like, well, but the black population is a highly disenfranchised in the male population in the Southeast because any encounter with the law, which is a whole lot of people, both white and black and otherwise, uh, gets you disenfranchised. And B, it's only 15% of the population, according to every census thing I've ever looked at. The explosion of people of color have come from immigrants. Are the children of immigrants. The Latin community, which in the middle of the aughts, I think it was around 2003, 2004, bypassed the black community. Now it's significantly larger. It's about 20, 21%, depending on how you count. With, if it is in allegiance with the black community, that's 30, that's 33 percent of the population. And when you look at current demographic trends, because the baby boomers are whiter and because they came at a time when immigration was much more restricted than it was in the 1980s. And this is not me complaining about about that one way or the other, although it was a conservative project to kind of stabilize the labor pool because people weren't having as many babies. And actually, that's why there's still elements of the center right that push for immigration. It's not because of the kindness of their hearts. I am pro-immigration because I don't think any of the borders are going to really maintain actually in the next century. And I think the social democ but I think the social democratic imperative is incoherent on this question, and it always has been. And it's incoherence actually predates America or the 20th century. I'm going to go into that in my sociology project and talk about the German historicist schools and the historic materials and how this has never been an easy question for internationalists, even though it seems like it would be obviously so. Anyway, this is a longer video than I intended to make. But I want you to think about these problems. They are real, tangible, sensuous problems. They are not just problems of ideological justification. Why can nobody build a positive project that has any staying power? Why is it increasingly the investment in Bonapartist projects? By the way, this is predictable and complexity theory by Tainter, that one of the ways that people try to simplify their society is by investing more and more political power in a single man, which actually causes all the other parts of the of society to atherapy, and also if there's not a mass base to control that man, as came up in the Michael Lind article I talked about um, sometime in the last few months, because I don't really see in order I record them, um, you will see that without that, it tends to deliberately drip into oligarchy and clientelism. Bonapartism tends to do that. Why does it do that? Why does this happen over and over again? Complexity of capital induces Bonapartist politics because it's a way to simplify the problem when nothing seems to work. 
you know, it has, it pulls from different bases of society, not particularly coherent. And in fact, if I was going to say anything interesting about the current basis of the political parties in America, is that they're both Bonapartist bases. They're both filled with, with coalitions that are trying to avoid the main mass of people in the working class and even in the administrative classes. And the bourgeoisie seems out to lunch. They're just not here. They're not running anything. They're they're living off of investments and no longer see investments in capital as particularly useful or even profitable for them to engage in. Reality check, people. The nominal left and the nominal right in America is not as important as understanding reality as it is. Understanding how the oligarchy developed, understanding how the iron law of oligarchy works, understanding how to hold them accountable. And if you run away from that because of nominal left or nominal right issues, because you don't have any consistent value for what left and right even are, what their orientations are, what their subject is, who they are, and what they're for, other than maybe some few public goods, and the, re the remediation of historical injustice, whatever the hell that means, because I don't know. Like, oh, it's perfectly clear. No, it's not clear. Justice is one of the vaguest concepts in political life, particularly when there's no agreement on what it is, and our view of the state is as a neutral power. The state is never class or values neutral, but it's presented itself as that since the 1950s. Why? And then why has the answer to that always been justification through crisis? This is not new, people. This also happened in the past. The justification of crisis was the whole modus operandi from literally the 1870s into the beginning of the Pax Americana. Why did this happen? Ask more of yourself and the people you're thinking about. The conversations aren't going to be enough. They're not going to be good enough, but at least it will help you think clearly. And that you'll be able to do something about it instead of being manipulated. One of the easiest ways to convince people there, um, to manipulate people is to have people think that they're not being manipulated, that they're above conspiracies or cult tactics or see the truth or they're ultimately critical thinkers. Those people are the easiest people to manipulate. They atomize themselves. They don't have a social being for thinking. That is all. Like and subscribe, hit the Patreon if you are so inclined, but you don't have to. Um, I appreciate any support, but I actually would love just for you to comment, uh, review, listen to the podcast, and share it. Have a great day.